Hey guys, it's Kim here with Fairly Fiber Fun. Thanks for joining me on episode 21. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about some spins, some work in the mill. Um, I don't have any knitting to show you, but I do have some um, life updates and shop news and things like that to share with you. So before we get started, I would like to give a huge welcome to all the new subscribers. Thank you so much for joining the Fairly Fiber Fun community here on YouTube. And don't forget to check out the community on Instagram as well. I am doing giveaways on Instagram. So uh, the way to participate is by um, subscribing to my newsletter in the shop and uh, responding to questions that I post in my Instagram stories. So I hope all is well with you. And if you enjoy today's episode, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button and don't forget the notification bell so you won't miss any new videos that are coming out on this channel. Let's start with my self-striping yarn experiment. I it, It's an ongoing experiment, so I'm still working on getting that uh, figured out exactly how I want to be spinning the stripes. The first one I did, and right now I don't remember if that video has already come out or not, but there's a video about how I did this self-striping experiment, so if it hasn't gone out yet, it will shortly, and you will get to see it soon. So I carded four different colors and divided them into two gram sections, except I didn't have a whole lot of two of the colors, so I took those two grams and divided them in half. So I have the pink and the yellow were very short, and the blue and the green were longer. And unfortunately, I had a really hard time getting my scale to weigh out two grams or one gram. It doesn't have decimals on the grams. I need a better scale, and hopefully we'll get one soon. I have the first skein all knitted up into a sample. This is 70 stitches on US 4 needles. And I averaged right around five and a half yards per two grams of spinning. This is chain plied. I just spun default. It's about a DK weight. It's not super thick or super thin, kind of an average. So now I'm curious. I mean, it worked out really well. The stripes vary slightly from one to another because the spinning varies slightly and the weight of the fiber varied slightly and it's life, it's hand spun. But I got to wondering if I spun the same amount of fiber per stripe thinner, what would it do for say socks or something like that? Um, and then I thought, well, it's really hard to weigh it out in each individual stripe. So what if I did Rolex? So I did a little bit of math and I wrote down, you know, if I did 30 grams and I did about 10 grams per color, um, except the, the yellow and green are five grams per color. And I laid them out in the same order on the blending board that I had done in this original spinning to create this fabric again in the same striping order. How would that work out? So I did that and I calculated that each stripe would be a quarter of the entire amount I put on the blending board because I usually pull off four Rolex. So I took the 30 grams, 10 grams per green and blue stripe, and 5 grams per yellow and pink stripe, and I pulled off four Rolex, and some were thicker than others, some thinner than others. That's okay. I want an average, and it did turn out a little bit differently. I spun them end to end where the colors were 
overlapped a little bit on the blending board. There's some marling and blending, and that's okay. Um, I didn't count the marling sections because they were like a quarter of a yard, typically, just a few inches, and that's not any sort of major deal. So then I wrote down, as I wound it onto the Nitty Knotty, not a Nitty Knotty, a skein winder, I wrote down my approximate yardage of each stripe. I did my math wrong. Oh, that's right. What I wrote down on one side was how many wraps on the skein winder, and what I wrote down on the other side was the amount of yardage average. So, a little bit confusing there, but it works, right? So I have each color in here four times because there were four Rolex. And we ended up the blue being about seven and a half yard average per stripe. The yellow I got four and a quarter yards average. The pink four and three quarter yards average. So a half yard difference on the average. And the green I got seven yard average. Um, but this was spun much thinner than the other one. So this is like a fingering sport um, and I haven't knitted up yet obviously I'm trying to get you to get it to where you can see there you go um, so yeah it it was easy to do it was easier to spin these really thin and I can't wait to knit it up and then show you what the knitted fabric look like looks like and compare the two because um i'm very curious i may have to use smaller needles different stitch count um i have an idea of what i want to make with this as a sample um but we will have to see you know how much total yardage i have oh gosh which I did not write down <laughs> and how much I need for a particular project. I did use up the leftovers and made up another. I had just enough to do one more batch on the blending board and might be a little bit over 30 grams, a little bit under 30 grams. But I thought, what if I did that with my shorter bits on the ends? So I have my long stripes in the middle and my shorter stripes on the ends instead of the long stripes on the ends. And then I start with green and end with pink. And on the next row, I start with pink and end with green and then green and end with pink. That way, my end stripes end up twice as long. Unfortunately, I can't show you the results because they're, I applied and left it on bobbin. So, you know, it's all plied up, ready to be skeined and washed, but on the bobbin. Kind of ran out of steam in the middle of doing that and we had tons of stuff going on and it's craziness. Absolute craziness. That's like practically all I got done in the month of February. Not quite but most of it. You know I did I did manage to finish thinning the singles of January's IBY, which is what I'm now calling the Inspired by You um, content products experimentation activity. There we go, the Inspired by You activity. Um, so this was the Rainbow Gradient that was made for January, and they're still they're still in the shop, so you can still get some. They're gorgeous. Fun up beautifully. So I thought I could get the whole four ounce braid on my antique spinning wheel and I was wrong. That's what would not fit. That's that little bit would not fit. So here is the rewound cake from my attempt. The bobbin got to the point where it simply wouldn't turn anymore. It was like, nope, I'm not going to take any yarn. So, oh well. <laughs> I had to finish up on the other wheel and then 
rewound this cake because I wanted this to rest. It's very high twist, very thin. I wanted it to rest before I wound it so that it wouldn't be as difficult to ply. So what I'm going to do is since the outside of this is the beginning of my spin and the outside of this is the end of my spin, I'm going to ply from the outside of both until I run out of the bobbin. And then I will just attach from the middle and do a center pull plying ball. Why not? So this is a Monet effect yarn and literally all I have to do is ply this and wash it and it's done. Monet effect is, I probably should have done Monet effect on Sadie's colors instead of this one since this one's already a gradient, but pretty much what you do is you take half the fiber and you set it aside as is or you strip it down and into two or three strips and you set that aside and the rest you card into a soft gradient. Um, and Grace Shalom Hopkins is where I learned to do this. She usually does the carding with her hand cards and she makes these fluffy little smoothly, softly blended um, little roll eggs. And she spins those and she spins the braid and, and then she plies them together and it creates this really pretty, um, gently flowing um, fractal. It is a takeoff on the fractal. So that's what I did. I set aside half of the braid and then I just stripped it off. I did this on a live video on Instagram. Um, I was showing how to do a fractal. And so I took the braid and I was like, here's half. You set that aside and spin it into end. And then I took the other one and I began splitting it down. Like, and you split this into however many pieces you want. So then I had to take every piece and divide it by color. <laughs> Blended all those colors on the drum carter. And then took each color and blended a little bit of each, you know, where the yellow is pink, yellow and pink. Um, there's a little bit of orange in there. So I took some yellow and orange and mixed together and I took some pink and orange and mixed together. I did that with all the colors, including green and purple. So the braid starts at green and ends in purple or vice versa. You can see the two ends here. So I blended those together so it would be a continuous um, gradient. And then I divided each little, I divided each of the carded colors into, I think four. So I would have four uh, repeats of the striping or the gradient um, to ply with the end to end spun piece of ribbon. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm really excited about this and I can't wait to see how it turns out. I would love to pair it with a really dark gray, I think, and do some sort of color work thing where you can see the color gradiating through the project. It would be really pretty. Um, but right now I don't have a project in mind for this. so. We'll see what happens. It'll go in the stash and it'll stay there until it tells me what it wants to become. So I'm really excited to, to really see. This is the first time I've ever done a Monet yarn and I'm, I'm just really excited to get it done. I want to ply it. Maybe I can get that done today. I don't know. Um, I got sidetracked by self-striping and experiments and then this was sitting on the wheel waiting to be wound off and I don't like to take the bobbin off until I have wound the yarn into a skein otherwise it never happens and now I took it off to show it to you so it may not not get wound off anytime soon I don't know <laughs> we'll see anyways um aside from the little bit of spinning and experimentation self-sharpening experimentation I really haven't gotten much done in February I had a long list of things to accomplish and stuff I wanted done at the mill and I got none of it done. <laughs> well, let me rephrase that. Out of the 10,000 things I wanted to accomplish, I did one. <laughs> one. So I have all this 80 pounds of wool pool that I bought from Hope Springs Farm. It's Gulf Coast and mostly pure Gulf Coast with some crossbred 
into BFL, Dorper, and Texel. So, and, and the fleeces are lovely, but they were, you know, not the not recommended to send to a mill to be spun into yarn. Um, and so, super cheap. I mean, it was just going to go to the commercial mills to be processed, and they don't pay much to the farmers for their wool. So, I bought it at a little bit more than what is typically offered per pound. Took the whole batch home. And it was right around 80 pounds, 80 something pounds. So I took it home and it's been sitting around. I've been playing with it here and there. You probably heard me talk about it. I've made a sweater out of it. Um, some gorgeous stuff. I have made dryer balls out of her so-called wool pool, low quality wool before. And the thought the whole time I was making the dryer balls, I'm thinking, but this could be spun into yarn. It's beautiful roving. So... Here's the, you know, the compass sweater that I made. Proof that the so-called low quality wools with a little extra TLC can still become gorgeous yarn. And so I've been gradually experimenting with different ways to prep it for becoming roving or yarn at the mill. And the day I came down with bronchitis, I spent the morning sorting one of the big trash bags we took the 80 pounds and divided it into three bags i took one of them into the living room and i dumped it all out and i began sorting by wool quality or into three categories the bridge wool coarse awful bridge wool the medium wool and in that batch i threw a bunch of really bad matted wool <laughs> and then the super fine soft amazing stuff the super fine, soft, amazing stuff, I don't know yet what I'm going to do with it. It depends on how the medium stuff turns out. The coarse category went underneath the day bed in our living room. Um, just plenty of storage underneath there. So it went underneath that. It's out of the way. I don't have to worry about it taking up space. Um, and then the medium, I was going to scour. It was going to all get scoured and turned into yarn at the mill and i got sick i got finished sorting all that wool it took me like an hour and a half two hours i got done i had worked hard i sat down and i felt awful it just hit me like that just one second i was fine and the next i was horrid and the doctor had told me it's not covid but i was like i just want to make sure so you had me tested for flu and for covid and which naturally both were negative i had bronchitis put me on antibiotics and a mega decongestant and um in two days i was feeling great but here's the catch a week later i came down with a double ear infection i did not know and for three weeks i was uh, a day here and there i would be fine and the rest of the time i was dizzy and nauseous and couldn't keep up with what I was doing or anything. I spent most of that time on the couch, watching TV, reading books, and I did some spinning, um, but that's it. That's all I did all month. That's what I did. Um, so, uh, February was not fun. Every day that the sun was out and it was warm, I was out there barefoot, short sleeve shirt just sitting in the sun i spent an hour one day just reading a book with my back to the sun the sun was just beating down on my back and my body was shading the book and um oh it was so nice these are the earth tone bats from the february inspired by you this is my interpretation of the answers that you gave to the questions on my instagram stories so bats versus Rolex, bats, you chose bats. Um, I lightly textured or thoroughly blended, you chose thoroughly blended. Sparkles or no, you chose no on the sparkles. So um, yeah, and earth tones are dual tones and you chose earth tones, but it was a it was close. <laughs> there was like one more vote for earth tones than there was for jewel tones. So it was close. It was very close.
So here's the bats that I made. Um, it was a pain in the patootie because the drum carter I bought when I first started spinning and when I, when I wanted a carter, um, I went for, I looked at price and I bought the cheapest one I could find at the time. I don't know why I didn't go with a brother. Um, maybe Howard Brush was just like 50 to $100 cheaper. I'm not sure. But the Howard Brush drum carters, they come with 90 or 92 TPI. And that is too fine of a carding cloth for the way I card. So when I was trying to make these bats, I got really frustrated. Every time I pulled a bat off, it fell apart. I pulled it off the drum, it fell apart. And I was like going crazy. So I ended up putting the fibers onto the blending board. I pulled it off as a bat and it the layers just came apart. And I was like, Gah! so then I took the blending board mini bats and I put them through the baby brother drum carter. So I had stripes that were like a half inch to one inch wide that I'm putting through this little bitty carter and stacking them up really thick because the teeth on those uh, baby brothers are longer than the standard drum carter teeth. So that it holds, even though it's like this teeny tiny drum, it holds as much fiber as the big drum or almost as much. So I thought, well, maybe. In the process of all of this rigmarole, trying to figure out how to successfully make these bats without losing all of my hair and without throwing things um, or saying choice words that nobody wants to hear, at least my kids don't like to hear them come out of their mother's mouth, I, I ended up ordering a Brother Standard Drum Carter Extra Course. 54 tips per inch or times per inch carding cloth and it hasn't shipped yet. I ordered it yesterday. I was doing this yesterday. So I now have a Howard brush drum carter. It's got the two liquor ends, one that feeds the fiber into the drum onto the swift, which is what the big drum is called, and one that is supposed to clean out the little neps and noils and unwanted stuff. Um, that's what the second one's purpose is. And so it does a really good job of carding, but it drives me bonkers. I can't get the bats off of it um, without wanting to pull my hair off. I'm spoiled by the baby brother. You just grab the bat and pull it and it comes off. That's how I want to card. I want to be able to do anything and everything and not just super fine fibers. And the Howard Brush Drum Carter does a really good job with the fine fibers, but it doesn't do the art bats. It doesn't do the fancy stuff that I want to do. So if you have fleeces that are on the fine side and you need a drum carter, this one is for sale, $100 plus shipping. It's used. There's a couple of teeth that are bent a funny direction. Um, the doffer brush that came with it has a few damaged teeth on it. I will, if I can find it, I will include a hairbrush cleaner, which works way better for cleaning a drum carter than the doffer brush, um, a dog brush, and which is what I use as a packing brush, burnishing brush, and then it, the, the, the wooden tool you use to break the bat and the clamp. Let's see what else? All the things that came with it. So it's hundred dollars plus shipping. If you want it, let me know. It's continental U.S. shipping only. Um, I will deliver within a certain radius of where I live. So if you're near the Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee border, you might be able to meet and deliver it <clears throat> in person. Um, it's currently dirty, so I was just carting on it. Uh, so I need to clean it. But it's, it was deep cleaned after I finished my sister's cardigan. I did all the carding for that job on this drum carter, and it did a really good job. Um, all of my previous videos with carding that were not using the little baby brother carter were with the Howard Brush carter. It's an excellent drum carter. It's just not right for me. And I want you to know that I'm not getting rid of it because it's broken, or because it doesn't work but because it's not a good fit for me. So 
and I'm selling it for like half price plus shipping. So you get a used, very well loved machine for a very, very affordable price. If you're looking to get started, it's a great starter carter. And if you're doing mostly fine fibers, it's perfect. So I have prepped some wool prior to being sick. Um, and what I've done with the softest wool from the wool pool is I've broken off the weak tips and then scoured. So it's been clean, but I haven't done much with it in a while. Um, it's just sitting here waiting for me to figure out what I'm going to do with it. So it's ready to be picked and carded. And I haven't decided yet if I'm going to hand card this at home or if I'm going to send it through the mill and see what the mill machinery does to it. I kind of think I want to card it myself. Um, another thing I'm doing is slick carding raw wool and then scouring and then carding into bats. The idea is to have from the same batch of wool, the same bag, wool pool bag from the same farm, to offer um, yarn, roving, and bats in the shop. Um, but it all depends on how the roving turns out because if it's crap roving, it's going to become dryer balls. And if it's good roving, if it's mediocre roving, I will spin it. If it's good roving with no veg matter or very little veg matter and very little naps, if any, um, then I'll list it for sale in the shop as roving. But if it's not pristine, then I will either spin it myself and then I can sell the yarn or make something with it, or um, I'll turn it into dryer balls because I'm not going to sell crap quality wool to you. I mean, you're worth the very best of the best, and so that's what you're going to get from my shop, if at all possible. And I know it's possible for those machines at the mill to turn the roving into pristine, the wool into pristine roving because I've seen it happen and I've done it myself and it's amazing. Oh, wow, is it amazing. Um, the first batch of wool pull rove, wool that I turned into roving at the mill a few months ago, um, I sent a sample of that to Sadie of Sadie Spincraft in the swap and she was able to long draw spin it. And it's the first time she has ever successfully done long draw spinning. But that particular roving insisted that that's the only way it would be spun. And she was just blown away by it. The consistency of her spin and everything. I mean, she was blown away and said it was the softest, most fun spin ever. She really, really loved it. And um, now I had I'd had to take the roving out of the shop because the... the custom order for hand spun yarn. I had to spin it up. So I now have more roving from the same farm, but it's now sheep specific. So you could pick up some of Aurora's amazing, amazing wool. Hold on, I'll grab some. Nope, it's not right here. I'll go get it and bring it to you. Okay, so I found Aurora's roving. Um, I was there when Aurora got shorn. And I was there when she was turned into roving. So <laughs> at the mill, I was working that day and uh, her roving is fabulous. So soft and amazing. Let's see if I can thin it out so you can see crimpy and silky. So incredibly soft. I don't know if it's going to focus on anything. Anyway, it is divine and so easy to draft. Like, oh. So, yes, you should get some. It's um, listed by the ounce so soft I would totally wear this next to skin like it is the probably the softest Gulf Coast there's no prickle at all it is incredibly soft yeah Jan 
um, the owner of Hope Springs Farm, she breeds for the fleece. She's a spinner. She wants her wool to be extremely soft. And often it is, Gulf Coast is supposed to be, is considered, there we go, a, um, a medium wool, but Jan's often crosses the line between medium and fine um, into the fine category. And I would say Aurora qualifies under the fine, <laughs> super soft and amazing. So if you've never worked with really nice Gulf Coast, this is a great opportunity to give it a try. There will be more roving, more bats, stuff like that in the shop. I am currently flick carding Clen Forest locks that I scoured at some point near the beginning of February, end of January. I don't remember. Um, and that is so that I can have clean locks. There's so much veg metal matter in those fleeces that I don't feel comfortable just listing them in my shop for sale as fleeces. Um, so I am prepping to card into gorgeous bats like Shamrock's bats. Like these. There's a picture of some of the Clun Forest sheepies. And there are, I think, seven of these in the shop right now. The Shamrock's bats. I'm trying to think. I've got two rams two ram fleeces. One is Bucky and one is Earl. Um, Bucky is the one I'm turning into a dress and Earl is the one that is becoming bats next. And then I'm about to start scouring olive green. That's the other one. Um, and then there's two more fleeces in the closet that I haven't touched yet. So that's where I'm at with the Clun Forest and the Gulf Coast wool. But I forgot to tell you, we went to Sheep Coat Farm, really close to Hope Springs Farm. They're both in Madison County, one's in Colbert, one's in Danielsville, really close together. And we spent the day with Sheep Coat Farm. They're in the middle of lambing season. They have Tunis sheep. They are so cute. Oh my gosh, the little cinnamon babies. Um, when we got there, um, the, the mamas were being fed and the babies were having their races, their morning races, and they were just galloping around one end of the barn area and then galloping back. Oh, it was so funny. I got a short little clip of that that I will insert now. It's just adorable. <laughs> they do have one little lamb that is struggling and she's in the house, just being bottle fed about every two hours where she was on Saturday. Hopefully she will make it. Right now, I don't know, but it was so wonderful to sit there and snuggle this little baby um, in the house and have her wiggle her little nose and trying to feed her and she's not quite got it figured out yet. <laughs> precious, precious little animal. And that was a gift. Um, only one of my kids was not interested in holding her. The others did. I got to hold her. It was a wonderful, beautiful day. And it was so nice to visit our friends, the Warners. Um, they're wonderful people. And uh, I brought home nine fleeces Saturday. Um, and they're good fleeces. I mean, some of them are perfect to be turned into yarn, uh, mill spun yarn, and uh, some are like these have to become roving and some are like I want to just play with these so um most of them will get processed at the mill and some of them I'm taking five to my friend Dana's this weekend and she's going to pick one or two to keep for herself and the rest I will bring back home and figure out what I'm going to do with those one I know for sure no two of them I know for sure I want turned into yarn Two of the fleeces I know I want to be roving. And then there's one that I'm going to turn into roving and return to the farm owner, to the Warners. So yeah, I think that's it. Stay tuned for future updates on the shop. We'll keep you informed when I'm putting in more rovings and yarns and things like that. 
um, trying to put the focus mostly on locally sourced um, fibers from, from farms that I can visit myself um, so that I can tell you exactly where the wool's coming from. I can tell you how the sheep are handled, what they look like. Um, I like knowing the name of the sheep I'm spinning, um, but knowing the farm, that these sheep came from this farm, it really adds a an extra layer of, I don't know, magic to the process of spinning and creating something like this came from the sheep of Hope Springs Farm. That's just amazing. While I can spin this, which is the Eider Top, I ordered it from Kamash Fiber Arts. I don't know where Kamash Fiber Arts got it from. I don't know where these sheep came from. I know they're a German mutton breed, mutton sheep, but I don't know where they came from. I didn't get to see those sheep. I haven't, I know nothing else about it. So the commercial stuff, yeah, it's great. It's fun. It's easy to work with. It's a lovely wool. I really like it and I would recommend you trying it if you never have before. Um, I'm knitting something uh, the Shift Cowl by Andrea Mallory. I'm knitting in this fiber. Um, it's really pretty. It takes the dye. Woof, it takes the dye. Um, it takes the dye very similar to how Superwash Merino takes dye. Just soaks it up in vibrant color. And just, this is way more vibrant than I was expecting. Um, but it's not, doesn't have that personal touch to it that wool from a local farm has. Um, and then if it's people that I know who raise the sheep, that makes it even more special. They're my friends, um, or I've talked to these people and they're really amazing. Like that adds a layer of magic to the spinning and the making with this wool that isn't there with the commercial stuff. So head over to the shop and give it a look, see what you think. Um, try out some of these local fibers from the local farms that I've met the people in person or I'm friends with them, um, or both. <laughs> and some of the sheep, some of the fibers you can find there are sheep specific, like the Clun Forest bats. These, the ones that are currently in the shop are Shamrocks Fleece, and that's the sheep's name. And then the Roving Gulf Coast Roving that's currently listed is from the sheep Aurora, um, which I was there. I watched her get shorn. She's a very sweet sheep, got a great personality uh, from Hope Springs Farm. Beautiful fiber, incredibly soft and luscious. And then the Polypay Roving came from the Lions Farm. And I don't know what sheep it came from. I only know that it came from the Polypay sheep that they raised on their farm and was processed into roving at Spirit Fiber Works, which is where I work part-time. Um, and, you know, this is what makes spinning a magical thing to me, is where the fiber came from, how it was processed, how the sheep are raised and treated, and the stories behind the sheep, and why this breed, and why, you know, the, the why, and the how, and that makes it a much more magical experience for me as a spinner to work with these fibers. Um, and then being able to take wool that is considered low quality and transform it into a finished garment. Like that's not a low quality garment. That's a high quality garment. This is, this is gorgeous yarn. Um, and it's beautiful and it's warm. It's the warmest sweater. I've, I haven't even washed and blocked it yet because I've been wearing it every single day since I made it. And like all of February, I wore this every day. It, it's just, except for the warm days, I didn't wear it then, of course. It is so warm and it's so snuggly and it's so comfortable. And it's from sheep that I have fed, given shots to, helped with the shearing, um, I've trimmed hooves. Like I have done a lot of work at Hope Springs Farm with them, just being a part of farm life and experiencing that and to have their wool and say, I know these sheep and I know the shepherd. That's really cool. I would love to share some of this magical goodness with you. So head on over to the shop and grab you an ounce or two of the different fibers 
and give them a try and see what you think. See if it's as magical an experience for you as it is for me. All right, I will let you guys go now. This has been a crazy long episode considering I had very little to show you. Um, so yeah, I will see you next time. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Bye.